Good morning and welcome to OETV's Crypto Dome. We are here live and in charge with Adam Blumberg, co-founder of Interaxis. Adam, welcome back. Yo, good to be back, Matty. Sorry for the week off, but uh, good to be back here on, hey, what's becoming probably the most important 20 minutes for anyone investing in the world right now, right? Well, let's be honest, if we can keep you under 20 minutes, that's a result in itself. So, uh, you know, it's the most important time of your day. That's it. Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, let's dive right in. There's so much to talk about today, um, as always. And we missed a week. So, uh, you know, let's catch up on some of these headlines. There was um, regulation. All right. We normally end with regulation, but let's kick off with some regulatory chat, right, just to get things warmed up. Um, Fed Chairman Powell was talking at an event, um, I believe, yesterday or, or a couple of days ago. Um, and he was highlighting the need of regulation in DeFi, and it had to be done carefully and thoughtfully. I'm not disagreeing with that, um, but then he did continue with the mantra of same risks, same regulation, as uh, as in line with conventional financial systems. Now, I kind of have a little problem with that last statement. Um, what do you think? Because I, I agree with the careful approach to regulation, but you, it's not square peg round, round hole time. No, it, it's it, look I, again, like you. I saw the headline. I like the idea of careful regulation. Uh, especially coming from someone like the the Fed chair, uh, the idea of like, we, we don't need to overregulate this right now. But then he kind of went back and said, we already have the regulation, right? He, he basically said, we, we have this already. But what I feel like a lot of what he's alluding to is kind of like the SEC. Let's not uh, allow people to lose too much money. We need to make sure that there's not a whole lot of money laundering happening with, with crypto wallets, um, and, and I think that's really his charge. He also says he, he's not quick to introduce uh, central bank digital currencies. He's, he's really not you know, 100% on board with that and doesn't want to do it too quickly. So I like the kind of measured approach from the Fed chair, not something I expected. Um, I, I'm not, uh, as, as I've said over and over and over and probably over again on this, I'm not a big fan of taking old regulations and applying them here. But honestly, many, some of the old regulations do actually probably apply right like we, we have to keep things safe we, we have to make sure that people aren't just willy-nilly you know uh, you know offering up brand new currencies and that, that are completely unsafe and unfounded but we do need some space for experimentation absolutely and i think that's one of the important parts right we know that there is definitely going to be some crossover we can't just throw everything out but one of the statements he did make in referencing the crypto winter which i found interesting was that he said the crypto winter had its kind of own sell-off, but traditional finance didn't necessarily go along with it. So he's already highlighting a separation between how these two asset classes behave. Then surely you can't necessarily have the same umbrella regulation to sit on top of both of them. Exactly. And he, and he also, I, I believe, highlighted in, in what you and I both read and listened to that he feels like the, the macro markets and what's happened with you know federal banks or, or yeah, feds around the world kind of set off what happened in crypto. And it wasn't necessarily uh, something that was only crypto, but you're right. He, he's kind of said there, these are, these are kind of separate markets. They're, they're, um, and maybe because of that, they do need to be centrally governed. But I think what he's also saying is, we don't need to rush to create regulation for it. Let's, let's make sure we know what we're doing. Right. And I don't know if he said it in so many words. I mean, that's like, I hope, I think I'm reading optimistically between the lines there. Um, but he didn't fully come out and say, we have all the regulation we need. Let's just apply it, kind of like the SEC has done. Um, but he's also not saying we need all new regulation right now or this is going to get out of hand. He, he's kind of going, take what we need. We need to keep people safe. We need to make sure we're not laundering money. There's no criminal terrorist money going through here. Let's make sure that that we have that under wraps, uh, under control uh, from a regulation and government perspective, which, look, I agree is important. I don't want a whole lot of terrorist money or criminal money going through the, the DeFi system if we can help it. Um, but what he's also saying is, let's not, uh, no knee-jerk reactions here, right? A lot of what's happened is experimentation thus far. We need to go with it a little bit, not have any knee-jerk regulation, because once you put regulation in place, it is really hard to take it back. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's definitely, we're progressing in the right direction where there's more and more people talking about it in those seats. And, you know, 
let's have a look at the fact that NASDAQ has now announced that they're going into the crypto world. This is obviously huge for the institutional customer base. This allows them general access in the second largest stock exchange. Um, and it's fantastic. So obviously, you know, not obviously, I'd like to think that these types of moves of people like NASDAQ coming to the party would help regulators, one, get more comfortable with the acceptance of crypto, and 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 kind of not light a fire, but but get them much more focused on trying to iron things out in a bit more of a, a timely fashion, rather than just throwing it in the air and pushing that you know can down the road. Yeah, and I think it look what it does is it brings a lot of that institutional money in into play, and what that tells regulators is the banks, the large institutions, Nasdaq, as we talked about last time, Fidelity, Schwab, they want to play in this world. They they see it as important. And therefore, it's incumbent on the regulators to to make sure that all that institutional money, all that pension money, retirement money, hedge fund, and that that trickles down all the way down into retail, make sure that that, of course, you keep it safe and secure, but that you're not you're not cutting off innovation in the process. There's no reason for all those companies, whether, again, Nasdaq, Fidelity, Schwab, BlackRock, whomever, to get into this if it's going to be the exact same thing as we already have. Right. There's no reason for them to put all that money in. And you have to assume that all those companies uh, obviously have the ear of the regulators, obviously have the ear of the legislators. And they're going to say, Here, here's kind of the direction that maybe we think that the regulation should go. Um, and, and what it does, you know, in my world for financial advisors is it puts a big stamp of approval on it. Right. When NASDAQ says we're going to custody this. That's kind of the okay for a lot of advisors to go, well, if, if NASDAQ says it's okay and they're actually putting forth the time and the effort and the money to do it, then Bitcoin and ETH at this point are probably pretty good. Absolutely. Completely agree. And now onto a topic of, well, I guess this has been some positive, negative back and forth between you and me, NFTs. Um, I've now come full circle and I'm, I'm not necessarily as firm a believer, but I'm definitely into the NFT party. So, you know, let's, let's see where we go with this, but, uh, Disney and Apple are coming to the party as well, um, in different ways, but you have been, you know, you've used Mickey Mouse as an analogy for a long time now, and suddenly Disney started listening up and they're, they're bringing it. So, you know, we've got Disney dipping their toe in the NFT world. Apple is, I guess, they're just trying to, cash in on on this this situation by being part of the access or the rails to clip their 30 percent coupon on nft sales so you know two big players coming in in two different ways but uh you know this is all again positive stuff yeah it, it it's pretty positive on the disney side of course the analogy i keep using for for yuga labs for board apes and and for crypto punks uh and the fact that if i own a board ape i own the licensing rights to that is the equivalent of imagine if at some point I own the rights to Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse or Donald Duck or one of those characters. And lo and behold, here we see Disney coming to the party. I guess they watch Cryptodome and they said, we should totally be in on that. And Disney, and when I say coming to the party, what they've said is they're, they're hiring. Um, I, I believe they're hiring lawyers they're hiring people uh, to, uh, to help them get on board. And these are going to be Disney employees. This isn't Disney contracting with someone. This is Disney hiring people full-time on board to be uh, NFT lawyers, to help out with their metaverse, whatever they're going to do in the metaverse. Um, but, but this isn't, they're just hiring some you know, crypto geek to come help them. This is hiring uh, lawyers that understand this world, understand the licensing of it, understand the smart contracts and, and ownership and everything to help Disney figure out how they're going to do this. And keep in mind, Disney not only owns Mickey and Minnie Mouse and Donald Duck, but they own Marvel, right? So you have all the Marvel comic book characters. They own Lucas, Lucasfilm. So they own all the Star Wars characters. Can you imagine if, if all of a sudden they put NFTs of Boba Fett for sale and Yoda and Baby Yoda and, and Iron Man? This is, this is going to be a huge undertaking and really exciting that Disney's getting on board. Well, this was one of the things that I'd alluded to a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about different people coming to the NFT party. And I always felt that if you've got existing branding power, now in this case of Disney, the success successful opportunities of NFT sales is just through the roof, right? As you say, Mickey Mouse is already an incredible figure 
globally, right, and across multi generations, there's no one that doesn't hasn't been exposed to Mickey Mouse. Suddenly, to have an NFT tied to Mickey Mouse, like ten thousand NFTs of different Mickey Mouse outfits and all this type of stuff, like they did with Bored Apes, you've now got a huge opportunity, and you've got great frothiness and excitement within the NFT world. Yeah. And, and look, it's going to go so far beyond Disney's going to take it so far beyond what we know of as NFTs, which is there's 10,000 of something and they all have different characteristics. Disney is genius at licensing. That's what they do best, right? Their stuff is on, you know, toys, cartoons, clothes, everything. They are geniuses at licensing what they own. So to take that into the NFT world, which as you and I have talked about is, is where uh, it's going to be so important with media and, and look, not just characters movies, uh, music, all of those things that Disney has at their disposal. You know, they have, they have sports stations. They have all sorts of other things that they're going to be able to utilize NFTs for that go above and beyond a, a picture that I my own rights to. They're going to be able to push NFTs into uh, licensing deals and licensing rights and copyrights and all these other things that a decentralized, transparent, immutable blockchain, which is the, you know, currently the Ethereum blockchain that, that's most of this, is sitting sitting on top of that. They're going to be able to push that so much farther because they've been in the licensing world for so long. And if they can marry those two and not make it kitschy and not make it a gimmick, like some, some of the NFTs we've seen so far, honestly, have been kind of gimmicky. Disney has the ability to push it into something that is no longer a gimmick. They can make it a real part of their business model. And that, that to me is tremendously exciting because they've they've seen where this this could potentially go well yeah you're right we've seen the gimmicky uh nfts and that was one of the things that put me off from day one but uh you know i'm not going to reference anyone i'm just going to say taco bell um let's uh let's have a look at ftx anyone who's been watching anything in crypto world has heard and been exposed to articles with ftx is sam bankman freed he seems to be taking over the world um one company uh, one bankrupt company at a time and, and just wow. picking up assets for nothing um i see the last one that's conversationally he's picking up is the bankruptcy ridden celsius um is there anything else he won't buy well, Celsius, the, uh, FTX, I believe, won the the auction rights to Voyager's assets. So Voyager, the, you know, the bankrupt public company from Canada, um, I, I believe FTX actually won those rights and is going to pick up the assets of Voyager. They're, uh, you know, going to make a play for for the Celsius assets. Of course, yesterday, uh, the CEO of Celsius actually finally stepped down. Um, so maybe that opens the door for FTX and SBF to, to come in there and figure out what they can do with those assets. One, look, I think he's, um, Sam Bankman fried is really good about understanding how important the industry is and how he can help right now and how it's at this crossroads and, and he can really uh, help to not have it uh, destruct, self-destruct. And so I think what I feel like, and I don't know him personally and I don't know what they're gonna do, but I feel like one of the things they're going to do is try to help make, make things as right as they can for those that had had assets in Celsius and those that had assets in Voyager as right as they can. They're not just going to give money away, but I think there's going to be a good plan because he doesn't need, in my opinion, to have kind of an ego behind it like Alex Mashinsky did. He doesn't have to save face at all. Uh, and honestly, he doesn't have to make it fully right with him. He can just buy the assets for pennies on the dollar like he's doing and be fine with it. But I feel like he's going to to try to make it as right as he can so that they don't get completely turned off by the industry. So, uh, Adam, you, you touch on it there, right? So, so far, a lot of what he's been doing has been massively helpful. He's almost put in a flaw in some of these asset values by helping prop people up during this crypto winter. So that's great. He's He's done a huge amount of positivity for this asset class, for this industry, everything across the board. Now, does that bring concerns to the regulators that you've got one player that's so actively involved as a linchpin, as a kingpin almost, in, in all of this crypto world? Right? I'm does sure. that raise red flags? I'm sure it raises red flags. I mean, how can it not? It, it would be, you know, pick, pick your bank. It would be the equivalent of some bank just sort of buying up everybody. Uh, it, look, it's something we had years ago with, with uh Telecom companies with AT and T that had to get bro- broken up um, into into all the the bells. Um, so I have to imagine regulators are going to have some bit of a problem with this. Um, but in the meantime, 
look, he's, he's helping all these people out with their assets. The, the alternative is that people just lose their money. So he's helping out right now. And look, they have been pretty good. FTX has been pretty good with regulators. They've been pretty good with um, trying to abide by what the regulators say and trying to help them with their regulation. He's appeared before Congress. Uh, he's set up FTX US and played very nice with regulators. Um, and, and he knows that what is offered elsewhere in the world is different than what's offered in the US. So look, I, I think it, it's a little worrisome, but I think there are worse people that could be in charge of something worrisome. Now he could be that guy that's just laying in wait going, you know, at some point he's going to strike and, and take over all, all of this and, and make it horrible. But as we've seen right now with, with Sam Bankman fried and with FTX, he's been really good to the industry. He's been really good at working with regulators and trying to make crypto something that is accessible to so many more people and in a, in a safe and compliant way. And like, all we can do is hope that that continues because man, the guy has a lot of money. I, I saw somewhere and, and I haven't verified this FBX, FTX has like a billion dollars in free cash flow or something. That, that they that's that just they, in his checking account right well well of course that's that, that's his uh nft money that's his spending money um and and interestingly enough the, this news didn't make what, what we we're going to talk about but, but ironically the president of ftx us actually stepped down yesterday so that. yeah ftx is moving their headquarters from chicago to miami even though they'd already started building a building in chicago um they're moving their headquarters to miami where of course they they named the arena there and they are, uh, and now they're, uh, I haven't even seen if they're looking for a new president or if they are, or if there's someone going to be promoted internally, but uh, their, their president uh, stepped down and he's going to go, you know, onto some other project. Uh, man, it'd be great if he, if he went to work for the SEC or something, that'd be fantastic yeah, for all of us. Kidding. But I don't see that happening. So Adam, I, you know, we've had a couple of viewer questions along the way. We've just got one today from uh, Dave in New York. Um, and for our viewers, feel free to send in questions anytime. There's links to the side for Q&A. We'll you know, air as many as we can. Um, with the predictions of a market crash, that could what could that mean for Bitcoin, other crypto, and NFTs? Now, we've touched on these topics. I know you don't give price predictions, but... I guess he's talking about the movement of the asset class in line with traditional assets. So we've kind of seen some of this with the volatility of the last several weeks. But yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, look, I, it, it's definitely a concern. Um, and, and part of that is the global macroeconomic environment is just bad. Like uh, there's no other, I mean, I could use a lot of other words, but I'm just going to stick with bad right now. There's not a whole lot of good happening in the, uh, for economic, uh, from an economic perspective. And it has seemed that Bitcoin and ETH and everything else, well, one, it has seemed that Bitcoin has traded kind of in line with NASDAQ and then everything else in crypto is traded in line with Bitcoin. So if you look at it that way, if the entire market kind of, I don't know if it's going to necessarily crash that much and, and I'm not an economist or anything like that, I think it's going to continue to go down further. I think we're going to still see moves like that. Um, but I definitely see Bitcoin and ETH and everything else going down with it. Like people are going to have to, they have to pay their bills and inflation is up. Um, they, they don't know where their, their money's going to come from. They might, there are jobs that are going to be lost. So what do they do? They sell their assets. So tying it, like if we've got traditional assets selling off aggressively, there's a lot of people calling out for a massive crash in the S&P down to 2250. Um, and for our viewers who might have seen the conversation with Alan, uh, Alpha Insights, Jeff Hughes the other day, um, we have, the naysayers are saying that things are going to get very bad in traditional assets. If we start seeing crypto, Bitcoin, NFTs, everything else selling off, as you alluded to, that might be the case, We've also seen analysts coming out like Willy Wu, the on-chain analyst. He's kind of highlighted some of the potential, uh, air quote, fl flaws in things like Bitcoin, right? So we have uh, Bitcoin futures contracts. And in theory, the way things are structured, technically, there could be an unlimited number of futures contracts which could be sold on Bitcoin, this kind of brings to the forefront some real worrying potential here. Right. And what you're saying is, look, we know that there's 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exactly. be created, but you can have unlimited Bitcoin derivatives. So does that, does, does that change the value of it? Because you could theoretically be, have exposure to Bitcoin without owning Bitcoin. 
And does that change the value? And, you know, honestly, I, I don't know, like we, we can probably look to gold and go, okay, there's gold derivatives. How did, how has that affected the price of gold? The fact that you and I can have exposure to the price of gold without ever owning a bar of it. So in, in my mind, you kind of have to look at something like Bitcoin in the same fashion. The difference is, of course, there's in the, the odd thing that we have to look at is we look at Bitcoin uh, and other crypto assets, but mainly Bitcoin from the idea of there's only a certain number of them. We know exactly where they are at any one time. We know exactly how they're going to be issued. Right. We know exactly how many new Bitcoin there are every year. We know where every one of them is in it, you know, every wallet. Um, the difference with Bitcoin, though, especially during this economic time and, and global turmoil, like it's beyond economic, right? There's all sorts of other bad stuff going on, wars and such, is are people actually finding more reasons to use the network? And therefore, is that going to somewhat prop up the value? People that are going, okay, my, you know, my, uh, there's a war going on in my country or my government's in shambles or I can't trust my banks and therefore I'm actually going to use Bitcoin for those purposes because I don't trust or I'm going to use ETH or I'm going to use USDC or something for those purposes and therefore the networks are going to get used and where does that where does the value of the network come from the actual usage of the network and not just the the idea of kind of speculation on the value of the token Right. And, and I don't know where that is. I can't tell you where that is. I think it's a unique asset in, in history in that we haven't really had that uh, had that before. It would be the equivalent, honestly, of if we could very easily shave off flecks of gold and use those as payment electronically around the world. But we can't do that. That's what Bitcoin does for us. Right. So we have this, this issue where you can create derivatives to give people exposure to the price of Bitcoin. But that's not the equivalent of you and I transacting in Bitcoin. But we did also, what we have seen in traditional equity markets as well during some of the meme stock fluctuations and volatility, we'd seen outlandish numbers of futures contracts written on some of these names where the underlying equity wasn't necessarily custodied with the issuers of, of the futures contracts. So, okay. you know, and we saw the kind of volatility and problems that that brought with it. Right. Now, accelerate it's, and exacerbate that on right. a much larger look, scale on something like Bitcoin. This thing could be disastrous. I, I, I think it's a big problem. And look, I, I wish regulators would look that direction and go, why, you know, we, we have to regulate the derivatives a little bit more to, uh, to better reflect the actual value of the asset, right? Because what you alluded to there on, on the meme stocks is I can create options all day on GameStop. Right. And it doesn't and it might not mean that there's some underlying GameStop stock that's actually going to change hands. Same with Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin futures are are dollar denominated and, and settle in dollars. They don't settle in Bitcoin. So you don't actually have to own it to, yeah. to trade the futures. So I can create Bitcoin futures all day long. And all, all you and I are doing is gambling on the price. That's it. And. You're right, and Willy Woo is right. Like that could be a problem, and I kind of wish the regulators would look that way because that's going to that could negatively uh, affect the price. I think in the past it positively affect the price when it, when there's a run up, on a run down it could very well negatively affect the price. And if people don't understand what they're actually owning, then that's even more of a problem. And honestly, Medi, like that's probably where the SEC is having an issue uh, issuing a spot ETF is to say what, what you know, anyone who's going to provide liquidity for a spot ETF has to have some sort of hedging capabilities using futures. And if we can't necessarily trust the value of the futures because there's no underlying asset, then wh what are we trading? And how are they effectively hedging? So exactly. uh, there's, there's multiple issues around this. Yeah, the, the, the hedging becomes a gamble. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, that's definitely some food for thought and, uh, you know, gets us thinking outside of the box on some of the things that the regulators should be looking at. So, uh, you know, more to chew on. Adam, more, more to chew on, man. Regulators are always fun, right? That's, it seems like we talk about it way too much, but we're at that stage in the cycle. At least we're not talking about will it exist. We're talking about how will it exist and how are people going to be able to safely and securely uh, own it and trade it and everything. Absolutely. And sadly, we started the conversation today with regulation and ended on regulation. You know, we got to kind of get some more of the fun stuff in, but it's important. Yeah, topic. We threw Mickey Mouse in the middle. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Mickey sandwich. Yeah. Adam, 
Thanks for joining me. Love chatting crypto with you. Always and, good. Uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Um, for financial advisors watching, don't forget, check out the links on the left-hand side to digital assets and crypto education for financial advisors. You can receive that certification to better serve your clients. Everyone else, thank you so much for watching. Good luck investing. And thank you to our friends at Open Exchange for making this magic happen live and in charge. Until next time, bye now. <laughs>